Amen. Psalm 119, verse 133. Psalm 119, verse 133 says, Order my steps in thy word. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. David's saying there in the first part of that verse, he said, Lord, I want you to order my steps according to your word. Now in Judges chapter 21, we'll want to look at verse 24. The book of Judges chapter 21, verse 24. And verse 25. Judges 21, verses 24 and 25. And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family. And they went out from thence, every man to his inheritance. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's a key verse in the book of Judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We want to use that verse over in Psalm where David said, Order my steps in thy word. And then use this thought from the book of Judges where he said every man did what was right in his own eyes. And think of the day that we're living in. Try to bring you a message by the help of the Lord on the subject back to the Bible. Back to the Bible. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for health and strength and all the many blessings of life that You've given us. We thank You, our Father, for the love of God that was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We thank You, Lord, that He lives within us and He's a comforter that will never leave us nor forsake us. And we pray, dear Lord, that He would have preeminence in this service this morning. And, Lord, He would talk about and tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, we know, Lord, that we get all this information from Your Word. So help us not to take Your Word lightly this morning, but help us to get back to the Bible. Help us, Lord, to let it be the final authority in our lives and in our homes and our churches and in our, our everyday uh, behavior. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that You'd help every person here to fall in love with Your Word, meditate therein day and night, and be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I pray for that one that's weak here this morning. You'd strengthen them. I pray for that one that's wobbling this morning. Lord, that You'd set them straight. And Lord, that one that may be discouraged, You'd encourage them. I pray for that one which is lost, that You'll save them. I pray that whatever needs to be done in this service this morning, that You'd do it. Lord, we know we can't do it. We know we're just nothing but a piece of clay. But I pray, dear Lord, Your power would come, Your Word would be proclaimed, and Your Spirit would have His will and way. And we'll thank You and praise You for everything that's accomplished. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to talk to you a little while this morning on Back to the Bible. I know there's a radio program that name. We're not here to discuss that program. I just want to discuss that as a subject this morning. Back to the Bible. We seemingly in our day and age have strayed a long way from what the Bible says and what the Word of God would teach us. And I want us to try, if you're with it, to stay with it. And if you're not with it, to get with it. And get with the Word of God. And stay with and say like David, order my steps in thy word. You know, preaching, as I said just a moment ago about with it and getting with it, basically two things. There's about 10,000 different ways and stories in the Bible of telling it. But basically, preaching boils down to this, two things. If you ain't right, get right. If you are right, stay right. And every bit of preaching uh, about uh, from the Word of God has that aim and that goal in mind. There were parts in the Word of God that tell you how to get right with God, how to be saved and trust Jesus as your Savior. And then after you're saved, it tells you how to stay right with God and instructs you in all righteousness. But now, our problem in the day that we're living in is that every man seemingly doing that which is right in his own eyes or her eyes, and have gone away from what the Bible actually says. Now, as I said the other night, talking about Bible separation, there's ditches on both sides of the road in anything. And But in this thing this morning, I'm going to try my best to help you as a Christian to let the Bible, and I said the Bible, I didn't say a Bible, I said, the Bible be the final authority in practice of your everyday life. Because you need something that you can go to. 
When a problem comes up in your life, you need something that you can measure it by. When a, when a decision you come to in life, you need something to check it out. You need a scale to put it on. You need a ruler by which to measure things by and see if they measure up. And that's why I say in our day, we need to get back to the Bible. When a young person gets saved these days, there's a strange big gap between what he sees in church people and what he reads in his Bible. And because of that this morning, we need to get back to what the Bible says. There's a big gap between what the Bible says and this modern day, sophisticated, Hollywood style type of Christianity. Now I may say some things this morning that some of you don't like. But I hope uh, I'm only saying it's right. See? A preacher's supposed to say what is right and what is truth. Amen. I found out that if you learn how to speak just right and don't raise your voice and know how to wear your collar and know exactly how to use smooth, big, long words that people can't understand, and if you get word that you can get around people and just tickle them right behind their ears where they want, the way they want to hear it, Again. that you'll be well taken care of and you'll be well thought of and you'll be known as a good minister. Amen. But fo- folks, this morning, that ain't getting us nowhere in the day we're living in. We've got more churches. We've got more preachers in this country than we ever have. But there's more hell and more sin and more ungodliness being committed today than ever has before. We need to get back to the Bible. We need to get back to what God actually said. We're living in a day when people say, I just feel like this is the way for me to go. I just think this is the way I should do. And you say, well, what about what God said? And they say, well, I just think this would be the right way. And our problem today is, brother, every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. I don't have to stand up here and prove this to you this morning. You, what's the most popular slogans of our day? If it feels good, do it. Whatever turns you on. If that's your bag. All of these are slogans that characterize the generation that we're living in. The generation that we're living in has this as a rule. Whatever you like and whatever you enjoy and whatever makes you feel good and whatever makes you happy, that's the lifestyle that you should use. And in our schools and in our colleges and in our university, like it or not, that's what is being taught. Values. 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 You take the kid in here and said, now mom and daddy tells you this is wrong and your preacher tells you this is wrong but you just do what makes you happy Junior. You do what makes you happy Sally. You do what makes you happy Susie and little Sally and little Junior and little Susie or grows up and they, they start thinking well if I think it's right it's alright. It don't matter what mom and daddy said. Don't matter what the police said. Don't matter what the Bible said. But I want you to know this morning folks we ought to get back to the Bible. How in the world are we ever going to have our young people to live by the Bible if they don't even know what's in the Bible? You know some of these old modern day scriptures they're using um, are, are far off base. Let me lay as a foundation this morning what I mean when I say back to the Bible. Now folks, this morning, we're not going to get into a big long thing. We could stay here a while if we wanted to. I'm just going to mention this and pass on. God only wrote one Bible. He he never did write three or four. It says three or four different things. He only wrote one. When God told Moses, write, Moses wrote it down. When God told Paul, write, Paul wrote it down. When God told Peter, write, Peter wrote it down. Now that was God's words. They were not half man's words and half God's words. The Bible says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I went into the store the other day, and I'm going to say a few things here. Some of you may not like, but it'll straighten you out if you'll let it. I went into a store the other day, and I saw a big book there, and it says, The Lost Books of the Bible. Well, if they, how do they know they're lost? If they found them, they ain't lost. But that's just to get your money, you see. Amen. And brother, I said, there's something about that at grab. And I say, what is the lost books of the Bible? And it had those five, you know, the Apocrypha and Judith and Tobith and uh, 
you know, uh, some of the other cartoons that they put in there and try to say that it was part of God's Word, but it was lost a long time ago, and it's now not a part of it anymore. But we need to go back and see what the book of Enoch said. And we need to go back and see what some of these books said. Now, the problem with the average Christian is they don't read their Bible enough to know the difference that those books ain't supposed to be in there. One day, a preacher friend of mine got up in the church and he said, Open your Bible to the book of Hezekiah. Everybody started turning, 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 turned about ten minutes and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And he stopped and said, You bunch of hypocrites! He said, Ain't no book of Hezekiah in the Bible. That's where we're at. That's where we're living. I tell you, we can pick up an old uh, better homes and gardens or housekeeping or something. Read that whole thing. Spend five minutes a day reading God's Word. Amen. I want to say, brother, when God gave it, there was a channel. And when God used those scribes to copy that thing down. And there's two families of Bibles in this world. You see, there's a whole bunch of different Bibles. How do we know which one is right? See, if one Bible says one thing and another Bible says the other thing, they both can't be right. They both can't. They're either one of them's right and one of them's wrong or they're both wrong. We're living in a day when you get a new modern translation about every two years and this one's better than the last one and this is the best one yet and this is the best one yet and this is the best one yet and brother, if they keep on watering it down and keep on translating it, they'll have Jesus feeding the 5,000 Kentucky Fried Chicken before this thing's over with. Brother, I'm here to tell you this morning, God wrote it and He gave it. Now, He promised He'd preserve His Word. You know what that means? There ain't no such thing as lost books of the Bible. God said He'd preserve it from this time forth forevermore. God ain't lost none of His Word. God didn't lose none of His His, uh, holy inspired writings. You think God can inspire it and then lose it? It's either a lie or it's still here. You find these two families of manuscripts coming up through the generations. One of them comes out here out of Egypt. This family of manuscripts comes out over here in Egypt and a bunch of different versions of the Bible come out of the family tree. Then you have this other tree coming up over here. Came out of Antioch where the disciples were first called Christians. And brother, this line of ever major revival this world's ever had come right through this line of manuscripts. And right out of this line of manuscripts, 1611, came our King James Version of the Bible. Now, brother, since 1611, God used this book that I hold in my hand to win more souls, win more souls than any other book that's ever been in the world. There's been more people converted by listening and hearing and reading this book that I've got in my hands than any other book this world's ever seen. And since the living Bible, modern day, good news for modern man, this news and that news and living letters and, and the ASV and the RSV and the new ASV and the NV and all of these have come out, it's really done a lot of good, causing confusion among God's people. You say, well, I just like my living Bible. Well, it's all right to read as a good commentary, but when you want to see what God said, you better go back to something. You say, well, I don't agree with that. I'll tell you what I've done. The other day, I was in a bookstore. I was looking at some books, and here come a nice lady in the store, and I, I suppose it was her husband with her. She was looking for a Bible. She said, oh, that's a nice one. And he said, oh, that's a nice one. And she said, but I is here in Marion. And she said, I just don't, I just can't buy one. I'm going to have to first find out which one our preacher reads out of. She said, when he gets up there and reads on Sunday morning, I don't know which one he's reading out of. I'm going to have to go ask him and see which one he's reading out of. And then I'll buy that kind. You got about five or six different versions out there in the congregation, the preacher reading from something else. Hadn't that, hadn't these modern day versions done a lot to keep clear up a lot of things? Now you know and I know, folks, that it would be a lot better if everybody's book said the same thing. It would be a lot better when the preacher up and said, open the psalm, that everybody's psalm would say the same thing. 
But the church is right here in this town and every town where the preacher's Bible says in Daniel 3, a uh, form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And a man sitting down here, the Bible says in Daniel 3, a uh, form of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And the preacher's Bible says in Luke 2, 33, and, and Joseph and his mother were astonished. And the people sitting on the pews, Bible says in Luke 2, 33, and his father and his mother were astonished. And the preacher's Bible says in Colossians 1, 14, in through whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. A man sitting on the pew or a Sunday school teacher, his Bible says, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sin. Now, which one of them is right? You say, I think you're making too big of an issue out of it. Well, man, how in the world are you going to study the Bible if you got three or four different Bibles saying three or four different things? How are you going to get in a Sunday school class and say, this is what the Bible says. It says, a son of the gods. And then somebody else say, no, my Bible says, the Son of God. You say, well, I don't see what the issue is. You need to read up and study a little bit. We ought to get back to the Bible. The Bible that D.L. Moody used and practiced and preached and believed. The Bible that Charles Spurgeon read and practiced and believed. And brother, they weren't as educated as we are in our day. Their excuse for translating it and their excuse for revising it and their excuse for updating it is that there's hard things to understand in the old archaic, outdated King James Version. I'd like to know how in the name of the Lord our grandmas and grandpas understood it. Some of them didn't go to the third grade. See, it's a money-making racket this Bible business is, folks. If you go to a church where your pastor believes and preaches a final authority, the final authority, you ought to be thankful and thankful to God for it. Brother, I want you to know we're living in a day. We're living in a day when very seldom will you find a church or a preacher or anything that says, if you want to know anything, we have a final authority right here. You can't hardly find them. Don't look at me like that. I know what I'm talking about. You pick out any 25 preachers in this town. You say you believe the Bible, and they'll say, well, sure. You say, you mean you believe this Bible right here, every word of it? And they'll say, well, no, there are places in it where it wasn't translated right. That's right, folks. Now, my question is this. If this verse wasn't translated right, how do you know this one was? And this one wasn't, how do you know this one was? How do you know which is right and which is wrong? Who makes the decision? Who becomes the final authority? I tell you who, Dr. Bottle Stopper. Whatever he says is right. I'm not knocking school. I'm not knocking education. You need to get all you can and can all you get. And brother, you need to have more of it and more of it. But I want you to know anything or any Bible or any teaching that takes away your faith out of what this book says is designed by the devil, brother. I'm here to tell you this morning, in your home and in your daily life, you ought to set this thing up. Say, now right there, whatever that says is final. Amen. Whatever it says, I'm going to bow down to. Amen. You say, well, you're worshiping that book. You're supposed to worship the Lord. You, brother, they're awful close. The Bible said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Brother, I ain't, I'm not bowing down to a book. I'm bowing down to what it says, thank God. And brother, I want you to know, if we ain't got no final authority, if we ain't got a book we can depend on, what's the use of even being in here? Just throw them down and say, whatever turns you on, do it. Have a man do what's right in his own eyes. Brother, I'm here to tell you, if we've got a book that's final, if we've got a book that's been preserved, if we've got a book that is God's Word from heaven, we ought to stick by it and get back to it. Old scriptures going around these days. Have you ever read You Can't Tell Winter from Summer in the Bible? I've had people tell you, Well, you know the Bible says, and before the end of time, you can't tell winter from summer. I have you to know the Bible don't say no such a thing. As a matter of fact, it says the opposite. As long as time shall be, there'll be seed time, harvest, spring, and winter, and summer, and fall. No such thing in this Bible as you can't tell winter from summer. Have you ever read in the Bible, the Lord helps them that helps themselves? Well, Brother Danny, you know the Bible says the Lord will help them that help themselves. It don't say no such a thing. Have you ever read in the Bible where the Lord Jesus was crucified on Friday? Have you ever read in the Bible where uh, there were women teaching the men and women preachers? 
Amen. I, it would tickle me to death, really. I mean, there's just some kind of woman up stomping and, and sl- that just don't... I mean, anybody with any sense knows that ain't right. Say, so, oh, preacher, you're down on the women. You ain't got sense you was born with. Let me tell you something this morning. You women are silly for wanting ERA. I don't see what the big gripe's about. You got it made. I listened a while ago. Y'all sing better than us. You look better than us. Yeah, we ought to be the men in our rights. The only thing a man's got on a woman is he's physically stronger than her, and if she's got good sense, she can beat him at that. Amen. That's right, brother. A woman can get a man to do anything she wants him to if she plays her cards right. What's the big sweat over ERA, brother? I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. Can you imagine a woman preacher getting up and preaching 1 Corinthians 14, 34? Now the Lord's laid this on my heart, folks. Let your women keep silence in the church. Have a hard time preaching that. How, wouldn't it be hard for a woman to be the husband of one wife? Of course, now our, now our day we're living in. We had a clipping out of a magazine down at the house the other day of this shit to me. And the man had become a woman and the woman had become a man. And he used to be she. She used to be he. And she, and she is about six, seven. And he is about five, four. Now, brother, that's the day we're living in. We need to get back to the Bible. God said he made them male and female. Heard one of, one of those queers said, he said, I'm just a, uh, I'm just a woman trapped man's body. <laughs> he ain't done it neither. Amen. God made him male or God made him female. Amen. He said, I don't think a preacher ought to talk like that. That's how far we've got away from the Bible now, brother. Oh, Ann Lander, somebody wrote to her one time, said, I'm having a hard time forgiving somebody, Miss Ann Landers. What should I do? And she wrote him back and said, Read your Bible and read it and read it and read it till you come to that place where it says, Love the sinner but hate his sins and put your, your marker right there and read it every day. Brother, they'll read a long time before they ever find that. It ain't in there. Hey, you know, Benny, I've read it, that's why. And I've read it more than once and more than twice. But I read it. Now it ain't in there. Where do you ever read the word Catholic in the Bible? It ain't in there. Where did you ever read the word Pope in the Bible? Where did you ever read in the Bible where it said Peter was the first Pope? The Catholic Church believes Peter was the first Pope. I know, I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. You say, my goodness, you're going to make enemies and you're going to tear everybody up? No, I'm just going to preach the truth, brother. And if God lets me, I want to preach what He said. Amen. Brother, you know what? They said Peter was the first pope. Pope, pope can't be married. And Peter was married. Amen. His, wife's mother, his wife's mother was sick with a fever. And the Lord come and healed her. And that's why Catholic churches don't want their people to read the Bible. They're discouraged from reading it because they say, you can't understand it. You better let the boom, 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 take a drink of liquor and turn around and let him tell you how to do, how to do it. Yeah. Quote you a little Greek or something like that. Hey, anybody in here ever reading the Bible where it says, my spirit will bear witness with your spirit? That's a modern day favorite. Well, just my spirit just bears witness. Oh, just spirit. Oh, just hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not making fun of nobody. Folks, I'm just saying we ought to get back to what this Bible says. Brother, I believe in spiritual things. I believe in the power of God. I believe you ought to be for the Holy Ghost. But the Bible don't say my spirit will bear witness with your spirit. It said our spirit bears witness with His spirit that we are the children of God. There's a lot of people think they can shake your hand and tell whether you're of God or not. You can't do it. I've been around people where I felt strange and I believe they did have a weird kind of a spirit. My spirit don't bear witness with somebody else. It bears witness with, uh, witness with God's spirit. And we are His children. 
I may have a bell there, but I'm saying what's in there. Be saved and God will make you rich. That's the day we're living in. Get on that radio. All right, now you out there, you send me that, you send me that offering and I'll tell you how to get green power and God will give you a $150,000 house. And brother, they're telling that every day on the radio. They're saying, I wish above all things you may prosper and be in health. And they take that verse out and they say, it's God's will that you're rich. It's God's will that you be rich. I want to say this morning, where in the Bible does it say it's God's will for all His children to be rich yet? We get to heaven, brother, we'll be rich. And we have all the riches of the Godhead in us right now and all the spiritual blessings. But he wasn't talking about a big bank account and a $200,000 house, $100,000 car. You say, I believe if a man's rich, God will bless him with a $100,000 house. Well, how about them people over yonder in communist prison camps being tortured under there? Are you saying they ain't right with God? They're a whole lot more right than we are. The Bible don't say it. Somebody asked a little girl when she knew anything that was in the Bible. She said, a squirrel tail, a rose from Aunt Molly's grave, and Pa's Masonic Lodge emblem. That's all she knew was in there. You know, the Bible's done us a lot in our day. It used to be a common book. Now it's a strange thing to see someone with the Bible. Amen. I went in Hardy's the other day, and I sat down there, and I, start, I, brought my, I took my Bible in, I set it down on the table. Everybody in there cut their eyes and just stared at me. Now, there was a big businessman sitting right over across from me. And I mean, you know, you could just tell he's a businessman. And he had a big newspaper stretched out there and he read that thing for 30, 45 minutes. And people walked right by. They looked, saw this Bible and they, they just kept a looking. Every few minutes they'd turn back around there and look. That's how far away we've got. We're living in a time when people think that the only place to take your Bible is to church. for a second, folks. You know what the part of the Word of God is for our armor? It's our sword. The Word of God is our sword, and we're supposed to be Christians of battle, soldiers fighting a war. Amen. Now, we come to church to eat and to be fed. We are a bunch of soldiers. What would you think about an army that had a bunch of soldiers that never even took their sword anywhere until they went to eat at the mess hall? So, well, we're going to go get your sword. They take their sword down there and sit down there and all eat. Go ahead, brother. And then when they went out to battle, they'd just go out there, just their armor on and everything, no sword. And when they went to work, they went to across the jungle, they never even took their Bible. When they went across the jungle on vacation, never even put the Bible in the car. You think, man, they ain't planning on doing much fighting. You're exactly right. You're getting the point. Well, the average Christian never plans on doing much fight. Never takes her sword anywhere but to church, and that's to look good in front of everybody else. And, brother, so that people think they're really in there. And that's so that, you know, it's respectable, and it's not embarrassing at church. Now, at some it probably is, but us here it's not. All right, I want to say a couple of things right quick. We ought to get back to the Bible, folks, in our homes. We ought to get back to the Bible in our homes. I'm going to say to you this morning, your home will never be right until the Bible is at the top. It says our home will be by this Bible. I don't care who you are, how many nice things you can for that wife and family. I don't care how much money you spend on them or, brother, how much, uh, if you know, what kind of a mansion you live in, your home will never be right until the Bible's up front and you get back to the Bible. God's Word has a plan for the home. We're living in a time when folks are trying to destroy the home just about altogether. The Father, 
In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, you know what the Bible says? Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. Now, I know you don't like that, but that's because you're not right you ought to be. Now, you say, well, Brother Danny, the Bible don't say for the husband, the man to be the head of the home. No, I know it don't say that. But it says that man is the head of the wife. The husband is the head of the wife. And if the husband's what he ought to be, and the wife's what she ought to be, she'll like that. She'll enjoy that. She'll appreciate that. Being a part of God's plan. And then it says for the children to obey their parents. We're living in a day when kids just run wild. Amen. I want to say something to you kids here this, this morning. Amen. All you kids listening, God wants you to obey your mom and your daddy. You hear me? He be, you better do what your mom and daddy says. I know a lot of people, brother, that disobeyed and did, paid disrespect to their mom and daddy, and they're done dead and gone. Because that is the commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. You want to live a long life? Life? Treat your mother right. Treat your daddy right. Don't talk back to them. Don't be hateful. Don't say, oh, mom this and oh, dad that. You better be good and respect and honor your mom and daddy. You know the mothers of our day and daddies of our day, it's a lot of our faults, I'm sure. Where are the godly mothers the day we're living in? Did you know that many children never see their mother pray? Hey, Mom, when's the last time that kid seen you praying? Down on your knees. Down on your knees! Old John Wesley and Charles Wesley is a family of 17 children. Their mother's Wesley. Brother, as soon as every kid had their third birthday, she put them in school for the Lord. Of course, she taught them about Jesus from the time they was old enough to listen on up to those three. But after those three, brother, she really got on them. And Charles Wesley used his training, his background, and wrote hymns. And a lot of his hymns is in these song books we sing now. And John Wesley and Charles Wesley was used by God, brother, that God used them two boys to change the whole course of the nation of England. Because they had a godly mother that raised them right. Many times the mother's left in the home while daddy's gone to work or something and God has left you there with those kids in order for you to teach them. And the Bible said in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 and 7, to tell these things to your kids when they get up in the morning, when they lay down at night. You mothers! You listening! You say, oh, I just, well, I'll just take my kids to church. We're living in a day when people depend on the church for all the religious training their kids ever get. They say, well, that's what the church is for. That's what we're paying the preacher for to train our kids. God help you this morning. You're in for a big disappointment one day. I read about this girl had a young, girl, young baby. And the preacher went to visit him and said, Oh, praise the Lord. Now you're going to bring this young kid to church, ain't you? And she said, Well, preacher, right now I just think he's just too little because... Uh, He's got to have his bottle and everything, and he cries so much and everything. And the preacher went back in about three months and said, You ought to have that baby in church. And the first thing you know, the, more, the, wife, the, the mother said, Well, preacher, she's, she's at that crying stage right now, and I just can't do nothing with her. As soon as she gets a little bit older, I'm going to bring her to church. The preacher went back when the little girl's about five years old and said, Now, mommy, you ought to have that girl in church. She said, well, preacher, I tell you, she's five now and she just squirms and won't be still and she got so much energy that she just, I, it just embarrasses me and I'm just not take her to church. Preacher went back and she was about 11 years old and the mother said, well, preacher, right now, my little girl's at that stubborn age. She just don't want to be made to do anything. And I feel bad making her go to church because if I make her go to church, I'm afraid I'll turn her against it and when she gets a little older, she might not go. A lot of parents got about that much sense when they say, well, my little junior don't want to go to church, so I'm not going to make him because I don't want to turn him against it. My mom and daddy have that. I've heard about your mom and daddy. Yeah. Amen. I want to tell you something this morning. 
When little Junior gets up on Monday and Tuesday and says, I don't want to go to school, what do you say? You get out of that bed. You're going to school. You don't believe in making him do nothing, do you? You know what you're showing right there? That you place more importance on school than you do church. Hey, why don't I just say a few things right here, folks? Why don't we just pull over right here just a second? There are a lot of folks that think their kids' activities and their involvement at the school is more important than the church, and I say you're wrong. Brother, education's good. Education's fine. But it should never, never take the place of God's house and God's church. Well, little Johnny had a little league game, and we took him to it, and it was on Wednesday night. I say you're raising little Johnny the wrong way. Brother, I'm here to tell you this morning, folks, we ought not put more emphasis on school. Here's what Mama said. Well, my kids got to get their homework, and that's how come we don't come on Wednesday night. They got to come in here and get all their homework and get up early. Yeah, what you're saying is you think that school more important than your church. And the Bible don't say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say miss church if you have to to get your homework done. Let them stay up half the night watching television. Let them stay up doing everything, cutting up and playing games and everything. It ain't going to bring them to church till 8.30 or 9 o'clock. You listening? You say, I don't agree. Well, it won't be the first time you've been wrong. You say, I think you're a smart aleck. I probably think you were. You was one if I listened to you talk for 45 minutes. We ought to get back to the Bible. Homework my foot. I believe kids ought to be a good student and everything, but if you get them and don't let them go out and play all evening, they can get it done in time to come to church. Amen. Most of the time. And if there's an emergency or something like that, God knows and God understands that. But one day, you'll reap. And that preacher went back and he said, they're 11 years old, won't you make her come? No, she don't want to come. He went back when that young girl was about 14. The mother said, Preacher, you're going to have to talk to her. She's messed around. She's running around with the wrong crowd. I wouldn't doubt and she ain't done been messed around with boys. And she's been smoking pot and everything. Preacher, can't you talk to my 14-year-old girl? The preacher said, I'll try to. And he tried to and it didn't do no good. And about 16, she ran off and got married. To make a long story short, when she's 23, in her third marriage... The mother called the preacher and says, I want you to tell her, maybe this time she's finally found a good boy that'll treat her right and take her to church. And then she calls up her neighbor on the telephone and says, I, I just don't know what's wrong with our church. They failed in reaching our young people. And many parents are griping about their kids turning out bad when they're the ones that poison the streams Amen. that their kids drunk out of while they was little. Discipline ain't going to hurt them. You ever read in the Bible where it says if your kid don't do something they're supposed to, make them go stand with their nose in the corner? Now seriously, you ever read that? If that would have been the best way to discipline, God would have told you to do that. You say, well, I whip him and it don't do no good. You ain't whip. If you whip him, brother, it'll do him some good. You ever read in the Bible where it says sitting on the bed with no supper? To punish them. The Bible says, spare your rod and you'll spoil your child. Amen. I mean, it don't say it in those words. But the verses are, He that spies his rod hateth his son. Amen. And you'll spoil him. And brother, the Bible tells us this morning that without correction, you'll never change him. The Bible said in Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Bible said in Proverbs 23, 13 and 14, with no, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Amen. You'll keep him out of trouble. You'll keep him out of jail. You'll keep him out of hell. Amen. You use that rod. All right. I want to move on right quickly this morning. I didn't plan on spending much time there. We ought to get back to in the Bible in our homes. In our everyday lives. 
Whatever turns you on, do it. Ain't that right, Brother Danny? No, David said, order my steps in thy word. How about the, the homosexual movement? You hear a lot of Christians gripe on majority. And I'm not saying I endorse or put my approval on everything the moral majority has done. I'm for the same thing, therefore, but I'm not saying I agree with all their methods. But I want you to know, brother, we ought to thank God we got some people in our country willing to stand up with Brother Jerry Falwell. Some of these people that are willing to stand up for the morals and decency and right in our nation. He don't have to be doing that. He could be up there minding his own business, preaching every Sunday, and living as good as anybody, bro. We're living in a day. They, they got up a movement now down in Miami where about everybody's gay. I mean, some of your kin folks might be down there. No, nothing personal. I mean, yeah, that's a known place. Dade County and down to the Keys and everywhere down there, you know. And all the gay. They got a movement now started called the Oral Majority. We're gay and we're proud and we are the oral majority. How far we got away from the Bible in our country? You say, this is just a, a choice of lifestyle. You have those old outdated, old, old moral ethics and codes and you folks ought to junk them. It's new morality. Well, I'm here to say this morning, God's not changed His standards of morality. The new morality is nothing more than just the old immorality. Amen. And God burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground five, four thousand years ago for our sexuality, and He still hates it this morning, just like He did in that day. I don't care if it's your mama or your daddy or your brother or your sister or you. Amen. He still hates it today. He still hates liquor. He still hates strong drink. Somebody asked me the other day, do you believe in drinking? Years ago, nobody had been dumb enough to ask the preacher that. Amen. Anybody have enough sense to know preachers and Christians didn't believe in drinking? Amen. But not now, brother. I tell you, we, we's going, we're going to take the young couples over to Gatlinburg to spend the night in October. And we're making reservations. We called up one motel and they said, yes, we'd be glad to have you. And when you get here, we'll have champagne waiting to serve you all. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and I done told them we was a church group. And I said, well, I don't want that. Amen. And they said, well, well, okay, if you don't. She said, uh, a lot of the other churches, when they come, they take it. Yeah. Yeah. I said, do they really? She said, yeah. We're living in a day. And people, even, I'm talking about church people. The world can't come back to the Bible. They ain't never been to it. Amen. We need to come back to the Bible. All these old country songs get on there. She's got my ring, but you've got my heart. And I know because I feel so strong for you that it's got to be right. If loving you's wrong, I don't care about right. If it feel it feels so good, it's got to be right. That's what getting away from the Bible has produced in our generation. No, God didn't say, if it's real good, it's got to be right. God didn't say, if it, if it makes you happy, and it makes you dreamy-eyed, and it makes you, brother, do this or that or float, that it's right. Somebody said, I left my husband because God told me to. I'm going to tell you something, girls. God didn't tell you to leave your husband. You say, well, I just put up with it as long as I was going to put up with it. And the Lord led me to leave. He never done no such a thing. Amen. You say, he did. He didn't. Preacher, brother. How do you know? Because he said, let not the wife depart from her husband. Amen. That's why. I want to say something, brother. This bunch of separation junk going on in our day and everybody going on the right merry ways and still serving God is a bunch of baloney from the devil. It's wrong for a wife to leave her husband. It's wrong for a husband to leave his wife. God said, until death, until death, until death, do you part. 
I know a lot of girls, probably some of them sitting right here in this church, you need a trip to this altar this morning. You think as long as everything goes like you want it to go, that you'll stay with your husband, but if he don't walk the chalk, you'll leave him. You're the soft wife in McDowell County if you feel like that. So I don't like it. Tough. Choke on it. So I'll never come back to hear you preach. Well, I'm going to get you while you're here. You probably won't. I want to tell you something this morning, folks. That is what the Bible says. That is what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Say, what if he's beating me up? I think in a case like that where a man comes in and beats up on his wife, she ought to hightail it over to her mama's or something get away from him. I'm not saying stand there and let him kill you. But I'm saying, brother, as far as you leaving and getting separation and divorce from him, it's not right. Amen. Never has been right, will be right. Now, if you've done been through a marriage and everything, I'm not saying that to condemn you. God's got His uh, blessing of approval on your home now, and the Bible says in whatever shape you're in, when you're called, abide therein. Just stay with it. If you're with your 15th, stay with him and be happy. But it's never right. It's never right. It's never right. Okay. I'm going to move on here. It'll be time for radio program a little bit. Don't want you to miss it. So you can enjoy a full two hours of preaching. Uh, what about somebody that has a dream? The Lord told them to do something. Well, preacher, I've seen a vision. And in my vision, the Lord told me that I was supposed to come over here and I was supposed to get up in the church and I was supposed to prophesy or I was supposed to do this. Just one requirement. It's got to be according to the book. Got to be. Got to be. Well, preacher, I just felt led. You better watch that stuff. You better watch it. I know the modern day young people's Christian hippie type of Christianity and a little bit half uh, rock and a little bit half cool daddy and a little bit of Jim Baker and a little bit all mixed in together yeah. puts a lot of emphasis on how you feel. Yeah. And you say, well, the Lord just told me and the Lord just told me and the Lord told me. You better watch that stuff, folks. You know what the Lord's told you? He's told you this. He's told you what you need to know. And you better really be careful before you start saying the Lord told you something. I've had people come up to me and say, Danny, the Lord told me to give you this or do that. Come find out it's something that had already been took care of. Old B.R. Lakin said the woman come up to him one time and said, Preacher, the Lord told me to give you a suit my husband had. Before he died. And he said, okay, that's fine. She said, well, you, hadn't you better come over to the house and try it on? He said, ain't no use coming over trying it on. If the Lord told you to give it, He knows my size. Amen. 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 <laughs> but the truth is, most of the time when somebody says, the Lord led me or the Lord told me, they're just trying to sound spiritual. Now, if that hurts your pride, I'm sorry. I'm trying to help you and I'm trying to say it because I love you. I don't want you mixed up with a bunch of junk. Say, the Lord led me to go over there and talk to so-and-so, and I didn't come to church Wednesday night. The Lord told me to go over there and witness so-and-so. Well, what did they say? They wasn't home. I've had people tell me, he said, Brother Danny, the Lord told me you was having financial problems, and I never had it better in my life. The Lord told, somebody says, Brother Danny, the Lord told me that this was wrong. I said, I don't think wrong. I said, Brother Danny, the Lord told me he's really blessing you, and all hell was breaking loose for me. I broke my bills behind and everything else. Here's what we got that's sure, folks. An anchor of the soul. Steadfast. If it ain't in here, you probably don't need to know it no way. If you had a vision last night, what you need to do is just look back and see what you eat for supper yesterday evening. Beans and onions and everything. You'll see visions. 
heard old Brother McGee on the radio today, and he was talking about this man set up a big tent in Los Angeles. And he set up a great big tent meeting. And brother, he said, they're seeing visions out there and angels is walking all over the top of the tent. Yeah, angels walking on top of the tent. said later on, he heard, boy, that man died. An alcoholic. He said, well, there's well, anybody after a few drinks could see angels walking around. Amen. You're going down the road and something will hit you. And you'll see Brother Johnny Ollis coming home late from work. Something will come into your heart and say, Brother Johnny's been coming home late awful lot here lately. <laughs> Wouldn't doubt and he ain't fooling around on his wife a little bit. He was like, the Lord revealed it to me. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, folks. This actually happens. And then you call up somebody and say, I, I just don't know how to say this. I just, I'm just worried about Brother Johnny. I'm just worried about him. Anytime somebody starts out, you just tell him to shut up. Amen. Amen. He just don't act right. He just ain't, I just don't know. I believe the Lord showed me he's running around on his wife. You know, the Lord gets a lot of blame for stuff the devil does. Amen. The Bible don't say Brother Johnny's running around on his wife, does it? No. Watch, right, you better watch it before you start saying it. Amen. You listening? You don't think you're so spiritual that you and God's got something going. He tells you something. He don't tell nobody else, do you? I'm not saying God can't uh, lead you and God can't direct you, but when He does, He always does it according to His Word. There's a guy that got stopped out here in a town not too long ago, and he had didn't have no tag on his car. Bible verses wrote all over it. Policeman got out and he said, he said, he said something like, "I'm gonna kill you in the name of the Lord." To the policeman, you know the Bible says the day will come when people kill you and think they're doing God's service. There's people today that murder people and say God told them to. And the preacher said, and the, and the policeman said to the man in the car, he said, you ain't got no tag. Do you have any license? No. Do you have any insurance? No. And he said, God is my tag and my license and my insurance. That's the spirit that's come across the land today. I'm, God will take care of me. I don't have to obey the law. I don't have to have a tag. I don't have to have insurance. God's my, my security. He's my everything. Yeah, but you better forget, not forget your everything told you to obey the laws of the land, too. Amen. That's what this Bible says. All right, let's go and we'll close. I could say a few things about the pastor, but I won't because some of you think I'm just trying to do something. His place of authority in the, in the local church. I'll say this, I don't even see why some churches are pastor. That's the truth. I don't see what they got one for. They don't listen to him. They don't do what he says. They think he's wrong every time he does anything. What in the world they got one? They ought to just take that money they're giving him and give it to help feed some poor kids or something, brother, and just come together and share and hold hands and turn the lights down low. Anytime anybody comes over to you and says, Hey, come on over to my living room Friday night and don't tell the preacher now because he don't believe like this. But you just come on over to the house and we're going to sit around and we're going to turn the light on and we're going to share and we're going to give our testimony and look in each other's eyes and we're going to do this and that. You say, Uh-uh. Any secret thing that has to go around the back of the pastor and the church, brother, and the thing that goes on in God's plan of saving souls in the local church, you better stay away from it. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to go to somebody's house and pray and study the Bible. That's good. You ought to. It ought not to be an old secret thing going on behind everybody else's back because they don't believe this. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Amen. You know what the preacher is in most churches? He's a referee, brother. That's about all he is, just a referee. He blows a whistle over here. Now, don't hurt him too bad. Blows a whistle over here. Now, stop that's against the rule. He's just there to keep down fights. His job is just to settle fights and go around pouring water on the fires that start. Brother, it's not that way. God's Word.
You know what somebody got on old Martin Luther one time? They said the church there said this. The church father said that. The church father said the other. And Martin Luther kind of got sick and tired of listening to it. And he said, the blazes with the church fathers. What saith the Scripture? Brother, I'm here to say this morning, to blazes with the Baptist, to blazes with the Methodist, to blazes with the Presbyterian, to blazes with the Pentecostal, to blazes with the Church of God, to blazes with the Assembly of God, to blazes with the independent, fundamental, premillennial, soul-winning bunch of nuts. What saith the Scripture? Where'd you ever read in the Bible where singers charge money to come and sing? Yeah, really. I can show you in the Bible where singers got money for singing. Nothing wrong with that. Look at how you get home. Nehemiah eleven twenty three. We'll not take time to turn to it. But there's never no one in the Bible where a preacher says, I'll come if you'll pay me $500. Or I'll come and do this if you'll pay me so much. Not in there. I think they ought to. They deserve something. And they need to have something. They deserve a good income and a good living. But not that way. The Lord said, if they speak not according to this word, because there's no light. I'm going to say this one more thing and I'm blowing. No kidding. You can tell. You can tell people don't read the Bible nowadays two ways. Listen to the preaching, listen to the singing. You can turn on a gospel radio station nowadays and listen to the songs and tell the people that wrote those songs don't read the book. Now, you can hear them old songs, brother, like in this book, and our choir sings, and, and some of the new ones. I'm not saying they're all like that. And the songs are just shot through with quotations from the Scripture. Amen. But you hear songs on the radio now, and they say things like this. Oh, lovey-dovey, hug my neck, hug your neck. We're all going to hug necks. That's why I say, greet, that's why the Bible says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. Don't you go around here kissing the sistren. Amen. And when we hug next, you hug the brothers next, not the sisters next. I've had some of them old women grab me like to squeeze the daylights out of me. <laughs> kiss me all over the neck. Now they'll shoot. Now, I'm not saying they weren't sincere. They probably was. But you got songs nowadays like, You tell the old devil that I'm looking for him and I'm going to hit him in the nose when I see him and I'm me and him, you know, this and that. Me and Jesus going to do something or another and ain't a bit more in the Bible than a man to moon. You better watch how you talk to the devil and about the devil and to the devil. The Bible said Michael the archangel. I mean, the archangel, brother, when contending with the devil about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Amen. In other words, Michael didn't say, I'm an archangel, man. I'm going to look you right in the eye, devil. I'm going to punch you in the nose. He said, The Lord rebuke thee. And God rebuked him. We need to get back to what the Bible says about heaven. The Bible says in heaven they worship God and not play golf. The preacher said he's going to play golf. Now, if it does, they'll surprise the daylights out of me. Amen. I'm just saying the Bible don't say that. He said, when you get to hell, you'll just burn up and that'll be it. That ain't what the Bible says. We ought to get back to what the Bible says. It's everlasting fire. Amen. My prayer is this morning that everyone in this church I'll say whatever this book says. I'll base my life and base my soul on what it says. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, laid for your faith in His excellent Word. You don't need to add them to it. You don't need to take nothing away from it. Just read it, believe it, and live it. Rightly divide it. Meditate in it. Day and night. God will help you in your individual life and in your home and in your church. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.